It is now time for member statement. The member from the PN Carleton. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, Ken Mail. That was referred this past Friday in a eulogy for my friend Ken Ross of little emails he would send to his friends and other community leaders just to sometimes give them a boost, to make them laugh, or give them some support. Each time uh, we deal with a provincial budget, I would receive Ken Mail with advice for the provincial government on how to pursue its budget, and also just a little nugget of inspiration for me to keep going. And I appreciated that. I miss Ken a lot, as I know many other community leaders do. Uh, he died at the age of 54 uh, from cancer and some co uh, complications with respect to ammonia. But I, I want to say this. Not only was he a longtime friend of mine and so many people in the community, he was a businessman. He owned Ross's Independent. He chaired the BIA. He was a member of the Chamber of Commerce. As a grocer, he decided he wanted to give back to all the people in our community and became a wonderful philanthropist. In fact, in the first five years of his business, he donated almost $500,000 back to the community. By this year, it had been up to $700,000. He chaired the food bank to make sure people who were less fortunate would have some food in their tummy, especially for their kids at school. Ken was a legionnaire. He was with the Order of St. George. He was a lion. He contributed to Canada Day. He contributed to Oktoberfest. Ken was the type of guy that makes us who we are in this assembly. When he died last week, it, uh, it really rocked our community. Young athletes who he had supported, like Kayla Maduk, the autistic community who he had supported, and uh, those within the uh, Barhaven Legion were also crushed. I want to say this before I end, Speaker. Barhaven's uh, community lost a great leader, and the Legion just yesterday decided to uh, provide $5,000 to the food bank in Ken's memory. And for that, I am grateful. And to Kelly Ross, Ken's wife, and to his four children, uh, my thoughts are with you, and uh, Ken's legacy will forever live. Thank you. Thank you. Members statement, the member from Hamilton, Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. During the break last week, I took the opportunity to visit some homes operated by the Good Shepherd that serve Hamilton youth. Angela's Place provides trans transitional housing apartments to young moms under 21, and babies can stay for up to two years where they are supported with, he with healthy lifestyle skills, education, and childcare. Brennan House is a 15-bed transitional house committed to youths aged 16 to 20, keeping them off the streets. They learn life skills and are provided support and tools to deal with mental health, abuse, and neglect. Jeb's Place provides a residential environment for youth with supporting families, the tools and supports when dealing with mental health issues, trauma, and conflict resolution. Notre Dame House is Hamilton's only shelter for homeless and street-involved youth. In addition to providing beds for 20 youth, they have on-site access to mental health professionals, a physician, and a nurse practitioner. Youth support workers are there to help the youth find their way. Their drop-in meal program provides thousands upon thousands of meals every year. Speaker, the staff in these facilities do a fantastic job with budgets that are severely underfunded. Government, government funding amounts to about $44 per day per bed, with, and, but with ongoing fundraising and their selfless dedication, they make it go so much further. While this government promises tax cuts to their largest corporations, these dedicated workers give their heart and soul for the children they, they care deeply about. Member Stamets, the member from Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to tell you and the members of this House about a young man named Austin Riley from the wonderful, riding of, wonderful city of Oxbridge in my riding. Austin and his family are taking it upon themselves to embark on a tour across North America where Austin will take, take his go-kart to race against others from Florida to Texas to California and in BC, Manitoba and Alberta. Earlier this week, the students of Oxbridge Secondary School gave Austin a resounding round of applause to help him la launch his tour. They signed banners of support, got to see Austin go kart, and even go got his autograph. This is an exciting feat, Mr. Speaker. What makes it even more poignant, though, is that Austin races with autism. He and his family will be spending their tour ta talking to schools and young people throughout throughout North America. Asking about, asking about the challenges faced by individuals 
and families with autism, but also about how hard work and opportunity can go a long way. I wish Austin and his family a safe and happy trip. I hope you, you will follow along with Austin, Austin's journey on Twitter at race, at racing autism. I am proud that the people of, from my riding take it upon themselves to spread compassion and awareness, and I wish them the very best of luck on their way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements, the member from Nipissing. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, last month I rose in the uh, House to speak about the two wind farm projects being proposed for Merrick and Matawan uh, townships in my uh, riding of Nipissing. I'm pleased to inform uh, this legislature that because of the hard work of the local First Nations, Chief uh, Davy Jonis and Chief uh, Clifford Bastine, uh, the five Matawa area mayors and many stakeholders, the Matawan wind farm proposal has been cancelled. Uh, while this is cause for celebration, Concerns remain for the wind farm proposed for Merrick uh, uh, Township, just north of North Bay. Last night, I held a town hall in my riding on the cost of wind power in Ontario and had over 100 people turn out. Uh, they turned out from across the region and spoke about their concerns with industrial wind turbines. Many commented on how wind power has caused their hydro bills to skyrocket, uh, claims that were backed up by the Auditors General in 2011 and 2014 reports. I have resolutions sent to me from the townships of Chisholm, Papineau, Cameron, and several others, all voicing their concerns about the proposed wind turbine installation. Speaker, this social engineering program has failed, and it's time Ontario changed its course. Thank you. Thank you, Member Stevens. The member from Timiskamy Harper. Thank you, Speaker. Recently, I had the opportunity, or yesterday, I had the opportunity to attend the annual March Classic meeting held by grain farmers of Ontario and London. It's a combination trade show business symposium attended by farmers and agribusiness people from across the province and country. It was great to spend some time with my neighbours from back home in District 15, a little place called Northern Ontario. The delegates took the opportunity to thank Henry Van Ankum for his contribution as chair of GFO for the last three years. I would like to echo that sentiment. It's been a privilege to work with Henry and his colleagues on issues impacting the grain industry, and I look forward to continue with working with the current chair, Mark Brock, as well. As always, the organizers of the March Classic had a, or, had a very engaging list of speakers, but this year the talk in the halls was not about the speakers or crop prices or even the weather. Producers were talking about the recently posted regulations restricting the use of neonicotinoid seed treatments. Many farmers felt somewhat under fire in the whole neonic debate. They realized the importance of protecting pollinators, and when it was identified that dust of planting equipment, they acted quickly to control the problem. Grain Farmers of Ontario continue to work with other stakeholders towards a solution, including proposed increased areas for pollinator-friendly plants. The government has stated that their goal is to have the strongest regulations in North America. Their goal should be to have the most effective program to protect pollinators and farmers. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On March 12th, I had the pleasure to attend the eighth annual Great Big Crunch. This event, hosted by the local Davenport-based organization FoodShare, promotes healthy eating by inviting schools, communities, daycares, and workplaces across the province to take a giant, synchronized crunch into a locally grown Ontario apple. <laughs> Nearly 170,000 people from across the province took part in this great event and enjoyed delicious apples supplied by the Norfolk Fruit Asso Growers Association. FoodShare is a fantastic organization in my riding of Davenport, which for 30 years has had its doors open to increase access to healthy food and food education in our province. I'd like to personally thank Executive Director Debbie Field for all of her work on this very important cause. Joining us at FoodShare that afternoon was grade two and three students from Brock Junior Public School. These students not only enjoyed some delicious Ontario produce, but also participated in many hands-on food literacy activities and learned the importance of making healthy eating choices. It is truly very important for every one of us to make healthy eating choices in order to lead better and more fulfilling lives. I'm proud to say that our government certainly understands the importance of food share services. And recently, food share received an Ontario Trillium food grant to support their new initiative to develop an urban agriculture and community building model focused on collective planting. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy I could attend this wonderful event and look forward to working together with 
with food share in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stamos, the member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills. Mr. Speaker, the Almont General Hospital is suffering from a five-year budget freeze by the Liberal government. The hospital has done an excellent job of reducing costs, but it is not enough. This spring, they had to lay off 11 registered practical nurses. I would like to invite all frontline health care workers and those who support them to join QP leaders Linda Melbrew and Michael Hurley with myself in front, of my con in, in front of my constituency office at high noon on Friday, March 27th. We will tell the story of how the we will tell the story of how this wasteful and big-spending Liberal government has caused our registered practical nurses their jobs and sacrificed the quality of health care at the Almont General Hospital. What a loss. What a shame. Thank you. Well member statements. The member from Kitchener Center. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Over the March break, while visiting people and groups in my riding of Kitchener Center, I had the privilege of meeting with Dr. Margaret Brockett and Dr. Michael Stevenson, who are directors of the Sanctuary Refugee Health Center. The region of Waterloo has become a hub for new Canadians, including refugees. The Sanctuary Clinic was founded in 2013 in response to this growing population. The clinic serves some of the most vulnerable newcomers. Many of these people were forced to flee their homes due to conflict, violence and persecution. When they arrive, they often have unique and complex health needs that require an integrated approach to care, including psychological, economic and settlement help. Thanks in part to a grant that they received in 2014 from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, the clinic has been able to hire a registered nurse and a social worker to offer public health and counselling services on site. At the Sanctuary Refugee Health Centre, no one is turned away. As a result, many patients are diverted from emergency rooms and walk-in clinics. And Mr. Speaker, this is saving us money. No one chooses to be a refugee, but as Ontarians, we can choose what our response will be to our neighbours in need. I'm proud to tell you that the Sanctuary Refugee Health Centre is doing just that, and I thank them for their efforts every day. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stamets, the member from the Lake Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm pleased to rise in the House this afternoon uh, to speak about an event that I uh, attended just uh, a few hours ago in my riding. The, uh, annual Franklin Horner Community Centre's Seniors Health Fair. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm fortunate to have many facilities in my riding uh, that serve uh, the seniors of my community. And one of these facilities, Mr. Speaker, is the Franklin Horner Community Centre. And they have served the residents of Etobicoke for over 20 years as a nonprofit charitable organization, and they've dedicated themselves to improving the lives of seniors uh, throughout Etobicoke. This community centre provides a range of programs from dancing to bingo, socials, computer classes, fitness classes, and seniors' lunch and learn programs. The organization boasts over 1,200 members and 52 different uh, subgroups that uh, have programming there. And I'm particularly proud of their vibrant seniors club and was fortunate to attend their health fair today. Uh, at the health fair, Mr. Speaker, they feature a trade show, vendors, food, door prizes, but most significantly, a presentation about elder abuse and uh, financial abuse of seniors. And I was delighted to observe uh, the well-received presence of Elder Abuse Ontario focusing their efforts on educating our local seniors with regard to bullying, financial fitness, as well as how they can prevent them, protect themselves against fraud and scams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 